When I started working on this film, I imagined I would be going around the world in search of the latest breakthroughs in the fight against cancer. I had, after all, lined up interviews with the world's greatest scientists. I will admit, I was looking for the miracle cure. I did not find it. Instead, I discovered incredible people doing incredible things. Every single one of them lives and breathes to defeat cancer. This film is about their effort. It's about their vision. It's about how lifestyle choices increase our chances of avoiding cancer. It's about how tobacco kills. It's about how cancer is becoming a global epidemic both in rich and lower resource countries. It's about the money and politics of cancer. It's about vaccines. It's about therapies. But it's also about survivors and what they can teach us. Basically, this film is about the world of cancer. It's all about hope, real hope. If people change their lifestyle through making choices not to smoke, not to drink too much alcohol, to be a little bit more physically active, to take care with other exposures, etc., like sunlight, um, radiation, etc., then they can reduce that population, can reduce the risk of cancer by 50%. There is a huge fear. It's a, a, people are very afraid of dying with cancer. They're not afraid so much of dying with a heart attack, and that's because, you know, it's sudden. But cancer is a long, drawn-out process, and the end stages are not very pleasant, and so there is a great fear about it. I'm an optimist. I think that we are making tremendous progress. We're gradually grinding the cancer down that by working through basic science, translational science, epidemiology, better treatments, people are living longer and living better than ever before. The death rates from cancer are now declining at something like 0.4 to 0.6% per year in Australia. Uh, there's no reason why that trend shouldn't accelerate. When I started my training, the person who went into oncology was given the same kind of respect that you would to an undertaker. You know, this person sat behind, beside the bed of dying people, held their hand, you know, wished them well, helped them, gave them a few medications, but comparatively, it's an incredible change. I am satisfied because uh, if it were not for the assistance that we get from these multilateral organizations like IEA, the services would be totally different than what they are today. I think we have never had such powerful means available. What we have at hand today has nothing to do with what was available 20 years ago. I think it is much better than what it was 10 or 20 years ago, and definitely much better than what it was 50 years ago. Cancer was a word that was linked with death, and we're trying very hard to change it, and it is starting to change. And now people are not frightened to speak about cancer. Most of my life, uh, metaphorically, we were running into the woods and now we're running out of the woods. And so we can document that we saved more lives from cancer last year than ever before in history. Over the years, I've heard the word cancer countless times. And like most people, I've been personally touched by cancer and seeing its tragic impact on my own family, my own friends. But I'm guessing that most of us rarely think of what's going on behind the scenes. Well, as you will see in these four films, the world of cancer is busy taking action on several fronts. Researchers are making headway. Oncologists are hard at work. Patient groups are active. Pharmaceutical companies are developing vaccines. And civil society is on the offensive. In the last century, developed countries have witnessed incredible advancement in the fight against cancer. 
For the first time in recorded history, their cancer mortality rates are on the decline. Clear evidence that cancer can be controlled if we are willing to adopt effective cancer control strategies and commit the necessary resources to supporting them. And yet, despite these successes, the global cancer burden continues to grow. Cancer kills more than 7 million people every year, and by 2010, we will be the world's biggest killer, and we have to fight it. Are we? Are we fighting the cancer stigma that exists in many nations? Do we understand the importance of healthy living? Do we have enough awareness, funds, doctors, and facilities? Most of all, do we care as much as we should? Let's get back to that week. So you're now in hospital? Yes. And they're monitoring me because I lost so much blood. I have um, staples around my neck. I am monitored very well, and they have to stabilize me. Um, so I was in hospital for a week, and that was the Friday. And the following Friday is when the oncologist finally came in. I'm from a small island in Canada. At the time, there were only two oncologists for approximately 600 cancer patients. And um, so by the time the oncologist had come in, um, I had an idea of what I was to go through. I have a very analytical family, so we analyze a lot. We have a lot of things going on, I'm always analyzing something. So um, we had kind of figured out what it was, but no idea on treatment. Not sure what it was, how it was going to be. Actually, that was a Thursday, and the Friday that they wanted me to start an outpatient um, chemotherapy for six months. So I had ABVD, which is a, the treatment that they use, a chemotherapy treat regime that they use for Hodgkin's disease. And it was every two weeks on a Friday uh, for six months. And then after a month and a half, I had um, 20 days of radiation. When you hear the word cancer, what comes to mind? What I found is that people know surprisingly little about cancer. They know little of the causes, challenges, or the options. Talk about cancer, and many people still today imagine a hospital, chemotherapy, loss of hair, and ultimately, death. In the next few weeks of filming, we are going to visit hospitals, laboratories, universities, and government offices to find out where cancer is today. We want to know what's new, what's exciting, and what is left to be done. To help us ask the right questions, let's visit an expert. What are the key questions that we should be asking of scientists and doctors today? I think the key questions in cancer, if you look at them at the highest level, are that is every cancer that we can prevent being prevented? Is every cancer that we can treat being treated? Is every cancer that we cure be cured? And are we providing palliation and supportive care wherever that's required? And if you apply that to each and every country and situation and region of the world, then we'll know how much progress we have to make in order to do better against this very um, large and malignant series of chronic diseases. I'm going to be asking about the major achievements uh, in the overall fight against cancer. Should I be asking more in terms of two years, five years? Things go slowly. You can only look at an improvement in five-year survival um, at least five or six years after you've introduced a new treatment, for example. I look forward to coming back and showing you the film and seeing if we've answered these, uh, these very important questions. And Thanks very much. I've got to say that for me, I hate the word breakthrough in cancer, and I hate that because I'm a cancer doctor. And every headline that's produced, usually, usually it's nonsense and rubbish, for every headline that's produced, I have a hundred worried, anxious patients and their relatives coming to me in the clinic, waving headline banners, telling us what they've printed from the internet or seen in television, saying breakthrough. What does this mean for me? Does this mean that I'm now no longer living under a death sentence? It's nonsense. What we have is we chip away at it. We've been working steadily, we've been working evenly for the past two or three decades. 
and we're gradually improving survival rates, people are living longer, they're living with better quality of life. But, but cancer is a, is a mixture of over a hundred different diseases and there cannot be a single breakthrough or treatment that will ever cure all of cancer or lead to that sort of finding. I agree with uh, Professor Kerr in a lot of ways is that it, it, it's so difficult and I'm sure you've heard this in many of the interviews you've done that cancer is not a single disease. It's many diseases. You approach each one perhaps somewhat differently. So it's, it's difficult to say uh, at, at, unfortunately at any point in the future that we're going to find the magic bullet to cure or prevent all cancers. I think we're constantly learning more about what cancer is and how we can possibly intervene. My opinion is that we have to focus more on understanding the basic science and how to prevent it. Although I'd like to believe we're getting close, we've yet to have policymakers and leaders understand the profound importance of prevention. If you study public health, you're going to be hard pressed to find any major epidemic or pandemic of disease that was ever brought under control by any means other than prevention. You know, prevention is key. And we can prevent people from smoking. We can prevent people from getting cancer as a result of their diet or exercise. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's just never been a priority because people have been at a loss for what to do. What can we possibly do to prevent cancer? And now we know. When you are poor, it's not easy to allocate resources for prevention because the, you, the impact of prevention is going to be many years after the intervention. And I think that we are in process, not only in, in, in Poland, but as well in Eastern country, to change very quickly, to have uh, much more understanding that cancer is preventable and that by yourself, especially by your life habits, but by, by your behavior, you can diminish or you must increase immensely the risk of having cancers. We have developed the preventorium groups. Preventoriums are outpatient uh, facilities. But the concept is to uh get the health, supposedly healthy uh, person to go to this place and learn about preventive uh, actions. And in this preventorium, we will identify the risk factors of the patient, give them education on that, and tell them the test that they have to do. Would it be possible someday to have a health facility, but with a sign at the door that would say, this place is for people without symptoms only? If you want to talk about prevention and you have to have a checkup, come in, this is a place for you. There is a direct cause and effect that can be demonstrated in terms of diet and certain lifestyle choices. Uh, I think almost everybody accepts that tobacco use causes cancer. That's a lifestyle choice. Uh, eating five to nine fruits and vegetables has certainly been correlated with a decreased risk in cardiac disease, a decreased risk of diabetes, and a decreased risk of certain cancers. It decreases your risk of colon cancer, for example. Uh, so we need to be talking about lifestyle and long-term type things, not just simple things like a shot, although you're correct. Uh, you know, we've, we in medicine have encouraged people to think of prevention as a vaccine against measles or mumps, preventing uh, uh, those diseases. What we can show today clearly is the connection between obesity and colorectal cancer on the other side of decreased uh, physical activity and different types of cancer. The issue is really the, the association between red meat and animal fat and colon cancer is strong. Uh, having said that, without KFC and McDonald's and Pizza Hut, the Asian diet is quite oily. Uh, so you do see fried noodles and you do see a lot of oil in some of the cooking. I don't think we can blame fast food entirely on this. Australia, I think, is the second most obese country in the world. But one of the things that we're focused on is to try to address the extraordinary intensity of junk food advertising uh, in this country, and particularly junk food advertising to children. What is happening is that about 20, 30 years ago, when we were an underdeveloped country, um, we had a lot more fruits and vegetables a lot of carbohydrates and very little red meat. See, Now that we have become 
a, a Western country, in fact, and uh, we are economically much better off and a first world status. The, our dietary pattern has changed to that of high fat, high protein, a lot of red meat, and that is the most likely explanation for the increase in colorectal cancer that we are seeing in the country. As lifestyle related factors, heavy drinking, excess intake of salt, and low physical exercise, these are risk factors for cancer here. The society in general, I think they have to recognize that what each individual does and how they live, to some extent, will dictate the diseases they acquire. So I am an advocate of, of um, trying to persuade the public that there are certain lifestyles that are beneficial to them. You should uh, have uh, no more than two drinks a day, and you should have a diet that's rich in vegetables of all kinds, fruits, and relatively low in red meat. Um, it, it doesn't mean exclusion, it just means not every, with every meal and perhaps uh, three times a week. The traditional African diet in the rural areas is a very, very healthy diet with lots of fiber, um, sorghum, rough mealy meal, meaning not very refined foods, and lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, and over the years, with the huge urbanization process, especially in the last 50 to 100 years, that traditional African diet has been replaced with a much more urban fast food diet. Uh, I think the uh, people in Peru are not very much aware about uh, healthy lifestyles, really. I mean, you can see a lot of gyms, but definitely if you see what we eat, uh, you're going to see that we eat a lot of uh, uh, food that is uh, it's not very, very healthy. You know? For example, we eat a lot of uh, broiled chicken, a lot of uh, fat. Ketchup, should I be eating it? Why not? Uh, mm -hmm. Potato chips. Moderation, is, is high in calories. Cheese. Moderation, because it's also high in saturated fats and calories, but it's, got, it's a source of calcium. Lean red meat. Yes, it's okay. Fish? Uh, certain kinds of fish are uh, probably have environmental pollutants like uh, mercury. If I have a choice between an organic banana and a normal banana? I think it's harder to say, but I would probably go for the organic banana. So, there is a problem of food, of, of obesity, of diminution of the physical uh, activity. The emphasis on uh, physical activity is harder to accomplish, although New York is a city of walkers, and that tends to improve, I believe, the, the ability to achieve a healthier lifestyle because of physical activity. People, when we talk to them with the melanoma, we ask them, um, uh, to try and get some insight into their background, what are their habits. And many of them will be absolutely confounded by the fact that they have melanoma because they'll say, I, I, I never went to the beach, I was never a cricket player. But what these people, that may be uh, you know, a, a, a typical Australian um, a mother and housewife, they don't realise that the environment is so harsh. So when mum goes and hangs up the washing on the, on the, on the clothesline out the back and, and spends uh, 20, 40, 30 minutes putting the washing out, and then she goes out an hour later um, and does it all again, she's received more sunlight exposure um, than, than someone in Britain might receive in a couple of weeks. Two-thirds of all new cancer diagnoses in this country could be prevented through behavior change and lifestyle change. And if we can help continue to carry that message forward, presumably we'll continue to see cancer rates, age-adjusted or in real terms, continue to see cancer rates go down in this country. So I can't get a suntan? No, you can. Uh, I think you can um, get a suntan. You can, but you would, uh, you would acquire it in a, in a gentle, controlled way with exposure in the earlier part and the latter part of the day. It would be uh, not evolve acute, um, sharp, sh short bursts of sunburn or sun exposure and associated with sunburn. Uh, and um, you could indeed, um, you don't have to be totally sun avoidant at all.
research has shown that without the support of your loved ones, family, friends, and workplaces, you've got a much harder chance of surviving this disease and, and continuing on that journey. So yes, we get calls all the time of people who've been victimized, whether it's in their workplace or in their community, and what they can do. And it all goes back to education and awareness and, of course, support. That's why some of our campaigns, such as the National Shave-a-Thon campaign, we really want to destigmatize the disease. And by also shaving our head, we show, hey, it's not so strange to be walking around with a shaved head. The, the first time I did it, three, three and a half years ago, lots of people came up to me and said, oh, are you, do you have cancer? Now they ask, oh, did you, sh did you shave for the Shave-a-Thon? The stigma with cancer globally is incredibly significant. Um, We've just done actually two years worth of research and it was shocking and alarming uh, to hear how uh, deep the stigma runs both in the developing world and also in the developed world. So anything from people feeling that cancer was contagious um, to people thinking that it's your own fault. If you're diagnosed with cancer, it's your own fault. And what we found is if, if, if that is pervasive in a culture or a community or a society, you can't get past that with other messages. You can't encourage people to get screened. You can't encourage people to eat well. You can't encourage people to, to support other people that they know that have cancer because that's the underlying kind of intellectual uh, idea or concept. And so addressing the global stigma associated with cancer is probably one of, if not the most important things we could do. They say love helps. Did it help, really? Yes, that and I always say that my treatment was not only the original treatment regime for Hodgkin's disease, that it was supplemented by my family, by my friends, and by the walks I took with my mom and the bicycle rides I took with my dad and the dancing and fun times I had with my sister who used to make me mix tapes at the time and used to just make me laugh. and. I think those were the three main things that actually probably kept me going. I still think there's a lot of stigmatizing in lower, in, in particularly as the education rate declines and in communities where people are very poor. Part of that is driven by the male in the family or the person's partner. You know, the sexual connotations, the, um, the physical, uh, uh, fear of physical disfigurement, and also in one's job. You know, if you're an hourly worker and you're working as someone's housekeeper or in a fast food restaurant and you tell your boss you have to be gone for five hours every week for chemotherapy, they'll tend to replace you. Uh, once you've been through the process of being diagnosed and treated, then what? You get back to work. Uh, if you've got a genetic mutation, and does that mean you're unemployable in the future? Uh, will your employer take you back? Even if you haven't got a genetic mutation, sometimes, you know, cancer? Oh, sorry. Really sorry to hear about that. Uh, really, I mean, I'm sure it has a big impact to your family and so on. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm sorry we, we, we haven't got room for you on the payroll. Um, have a nice day. I don't think that cancer is a problem for reintegrating into society here in Peru, at least. I haven't heard any, any problems concerning that. Our, all, all of our patients that we treat go into the work again, go into their families again with no problems at all. At all. It has gone down tremendously. Uh, it's not gone 100%. It also it depends on which part of the country. So in 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 cities, you know, it's 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 basically gone. It, you still have some rural areas where this stigma might be still going on. But you know, I remember this has changed in the last 30 years, 20 years. I remember when I was in medical school, people would come and they would say, you know, I had a bad disease or I had what we call it here, a ugly disease. Now they come to you and say, listen, I had breast cancer, and, and I'm here, and I'm fighting, and, 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 and so it has changed, and it's, it's really, it's good. It was a diner? Yes, it was, a, it was called Pat and Willie's Mexican Grill. You're making me hungry. <laughs> um, your first day back, what was the reception like? Was it positive? Oh, fabulous. My, the reason I spoke before about having a very strong community and family sense is that when I was um, diagnosed the first time in 1997, my community came together and they had a benefit dance for me. And 260 people came. They, the f farmers and the, the old ladies making their own jam in order to, they had a huge auction. Um, 
the fishermen came with their lobsters, uh, everything to be auctioned, whatever you could imagine. The 90-year-old down the street came with her, her little pots of jam, and they had just a, and then they had a big dance where one of the local bands came and played for free, and and I think they raised about five thousand dollars that night just for me. So there's your sense of community, and and love within that community, and. When I was going to get a bone marrow transplant, my work got together and um, rented one of the pool halls and had an auction again. And one of the local bands came and loads of people came. And I think again, about $4,000, $5,000. So my work was fabulous to me. And they, came, they said, you come be a hostess Friday and Saturday nights for a couple hours, uh, whatever you can do, whatever you're up to doing. So it kind of got me back into the stream of the work as well, and not just to sit home and say, I can't do anything, or I've quit my job. And so it helped me get back into the society, which was what I needed and what I wanted. Way back in the 70s, uh, people worldwide have been starting to use actors to, uh, to look at teaching communication skills with doctors. I mean, we've, we've had workshops where we've had 40 or 50 hard-bitten obstetricians sitting around in a, in a situation with tears in their eyes, you know, just mopping away tears of a situation that's just a, a bread and butter one for them every day. But in the workshop itself, when they're watching and not engaged, all the emotion and all the complexity comes across and they feel it. Well, I can confirm that from having tried it today myself, that it was not easy. It's not easy. That hot seat's not easy at all. I'm, I'm happy that you already know what you have. Well, because... I might not, because he said that, and then he was going to come back this morning, and I figured he was going to give me more results. I mean, how can they get the result that quickly? I've only been in an anesthetic about an hour, and he's telling me... Well, the, the, the wonders of medical science, but, you know, listen... So that means... Yeah. So you think I've really got the results, and Look, that's really what's wrong with me? Let's because find out. Because if Maybe it is, I mean... It. The other thing that occurred to me is, how do they get me results mixed up? Because I've been walking around a bit, you know, I got up and I got dressed ready to go, and I walked down the end of the ward, and there's a girl down there who's got cancer, and I'm just thinking... It's as if it's virtual reality, that we create a scenario in which the patient is a patient, now that the, the doctor goes into the situation knowing it's a role play, knowing it's an actor, but because the actor is so committed to it, within 30 seconds, they're forgotten. I'm having a hard time at this point um, I'm, I'm trying to get her to shift into the knowledge mode, into the thinking as opposed to feeling mode. And, and only their mind knows that it's an actor, but everything else is saying this is a patient. And just part of me wants to relax and just think, yes, you're right. Part of me thinks, oh, but you're telling me I really do have cancer and, and, and you haven't seen my records and, 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 and can I really relax or... Or what's it going to mean to me anyway if I really do have cancer? And what drama gives us the opportunity is to sit and look at our life, which we normally don't get a chance to do. So, either of you got a, any comments? I guess what I picked up was that um, with all good intentions, I'm not sure that Anne was ready to hear um, what was being said. I think that um, looking at her body language, um, she was a little bit confused about um, the information being given and it was adding to her anxiety rather than addressing the anxiety because it just added a little bit more of um, um, indecision and, and confusion to her thought process. The media is always excited about the latest and cancer cures and high tech doesn't emphasize enough the importance of tobacco, how bad tobacco usage is, and what preventive measures are available. Uh, we get good coverage and, and they are always quite keen to have uh, stories coming out on advances that we have contributed to in cancer research, um, certain success stories in terms of treatment, and also um, human interest stories on cancer survivors. What is sometimes of some concern is that the media sometimes makes it look a little too optimistic than we would like it to be. 
Uh, breakthroughs do come, uh, but they always breakthroughs at different levels. They're breakthroughs at the mouse level, so you can cure mouse cancer. It doesn't necessarily mean you can cure human cancer. I think scientists tend to oversell for the public, so they, that, and maybe it's not just, it's probably not the scientists, it's the PR machines attached to the institutions that scientists work for, that so and throw, so has a breakthrough that will will translate into a better therapy for cancer. And the reality is, is that we're just, I'll use the analogy that you use, we're chipping away at a very large problem and it takes lots of people from lots of different angles. And every once in a while there is a true breakthrough. I think the discovery of stem cells, um, the discovery of gene, specific gene mutations, um, there's some enabling technologies that really help us to get new insights. And then when you get a little bit of a crack in the block, you can drive a wedge and make but it's all one small step at a time, and I think we get, you know, public awareness fatigue after if you keep trumpeting, you know, our researchers are doing better than their researchers, because everybody is contributing, and you never know where the next major breakthrough is going to come. My 14-year-old daughter just got her first HPV vaccine shot. Mm -hmm. Was that a mistake, or was that a good choice? My 11-year-old daughter just got her first HPV vaccine. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I, yeah, I am very excited about the HPV vaccine. Uh, uh, it is indeed possible that we can think of cervical cancer, one of the leading causes of cancer death for women around the world, uh, the same way we now think of smallpox. It is indeed possible that we could uh, dramatically, dramatically decrease the number of deaths. That is clear. Uh, and we might actually even be able to abolish uh, cervical cancer as a disease if we could just get the vaccine to enough people. It's, it, it has become, it's gone from being a scientific issue to being a logistical issue. The evidence we have puts it beyond doubt that infection with one of a small group of HPVs is the cause of cancer of the cervix in women. It also looks very likely that it's the cause of cancer of the anus in men and women. And there's uh, increasing evidence of a strong association with a group of other cancers. Vulva in women, vagina in women, penis in men, and a couple of places in the mouth and throat, base of the tongue, and the epithelium that covers the tonsil in men and women. And actually it's important because if you look worldwide, um, it looks as though HPV infection is the cause of about 4% of all human cancers. So four out of every 100 cancers is caused by infection with HPV. Uh, the aim here is going to be to vaccinate all uh, uh, young females, I think the age span is between uh, uh, 9 and 13 years. Um, There's uh, clearly uh, um, a, a, a very strong uh, position here to, to implement the vaccination as soon as possible, so I'm very positive. I think these new vaccines for, for us, uh, for the scientific community and for the general public is really a breakthrough. And for two reasons. The first one is that it is the first time that we have a potential possible primary prevention against the cancer, which means that you can avoid getting the uh, uh, virus which causes a cancer. And the second reason is that it re represents a major advance in, in vaccinology right now. HPV vaccine offers us a, an enormous opportunity. Um, yeah, in the U.S., we've, we've seen we have been able to reduce um, a cervical cancer in the world. It's still a major cancer killer uh, among women, and it's something that, if it can be delivered less expensively than it's, it is right now, and more broadly than we're going to be able to do right now, there's no doubt it's going to have a positive effect. I think this vaccine, uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, recommendation, has been now recommended in something like 70 countries around the world. So which means that this is a, uh, an incredible public health success. And obviously I think we have to follow this and, and to provide a vaccine to those who need it. The HPV vaccine 
is a, a great, great challenge because the, the price is very, very expensive for us. Uh, I, I think that the HPV vaccine is a, a great step in research or in, in policy of cervical cancer, but uh, is, is very expensive for us. Number one cancer in women remains the cancer of the cervix. So HPV is a godsend for you, the vaccine? But, well, if we can afford it, not at $300 for two, uh, two, for two injections, certainly not. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually a real scandal that we need vaccines in our part of the world, badly. Uh, the parts of the world who today are using vaccines at $300 don't have cancer cervix to worry about. So we desperately need vaccines. But even if we introduce vaccines today, for the next 25 years, you've still got these large 100,000 women to treat who have cancer cervix. So, you know, you've got that, uh, that you've got to sort of weigh that interim We've got to do both vaccines and treat cancer cervix today, and hopefully 20 years from now, cancer cervix diminishes. But we can't afford vaccines at this moment of time. No way. You have to have a vaccine which is under $10. For the moment, the HPV vaccine is a dream for us, so no access for, for such uh, uh, preventive uh, uses. You know, we need to differentiate the price the cost and the value. The price is something which is linked to the uh, uh, one device, one product, and as I said, could be differential. The cost includes how to manage uh, the policy, the infrastructure, and could be much more expensive than the price of the vaccine. But we have to think also about the value of what we are doing. And basically, these value, when you consider the total costs of what represent receiving three doses of a vaccine in a life compared to what's going to be the burden of disease of hundreds of thousands of millions of, of uh, women suffering from precancerous and cancerous lesions. The value has to be balanced. Is Peru going to be able to afford the HPV vaccine? Uh, I consider that at this moment that is very difficult, but probably in the future. And it's very difficult now because of the cost, but not because that we are, we are against that, because we have participated in several trials that have proved the benefits of this uh, vaccine. But uh, as a national campaign, we are not prepared yet for that. This could basically eradicate a disease that is a major killer. And it's not only a, a, a disease that kills a lot of women, but also it's a source for a tremendous amount of pain uh, and tremendous amount of, 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 of suffering. Um, the data that we have is superb. Uh, the follow-up that we have is appropriate. And yes, we don't know what will happen 20 years from now, but with the data that we have, I am so confident that is strong enough that I would be very much in favor of immediate implementation of the vaccine as broadly as we can uh, all over the world. So after I came back from um, Ontario, I went back to university. My work at the time, I was working as a waitress. They were very good to me. They let me come back as a hostess um, so I could get a couple nights shifts in. I just had, I was very content to move on with my life. And three months later, on my first three month checkup, they said it's moved. It has metastasized in the lymph nodes around your stomach. So I think after um, much crying, I. Um, sorry. No, go on. I thought, oh, I have to do it all over again. But in saying that, if I hadn't done that, then I wouldn't have met um, a really good friend that I met in the hospital. She was diagnosed with leukemia at the time, and it was my other first young person. What was her name? I, Elaine. Elaine. Elaine Goody, yeah. And uh, so, so we kind of went through the next year, different, um, sorry, 
How did it go finally? Did you, um, same treatment, chemotherapy? And well, actually, because it came back, they said the only way um, to have a cure is to have a bone marrow transplant. Is that what you had? So I had actually a stem cell autologous transplant, which means that I was my own donor and recipient kind of thing. And um, so I had to have one week of um, mini beam, which was, the, which was the treatment for that, one week every 12 hours in the hospital, then three weeks off, one week of, um, one week every 12 hours again, four weeks off, and then I had my um, stem cell. I'm fascinated by how well you remember it all. I know, it's in my head, and um, I don't think it will ever leave. It's, you have flashbacks, and you, it's just something that made me who I am today. I personally, I'm so attracted with my country, with my hospital. I'm trying to do all my best for the developing, developing training of young people to do the best, to do as much as we can for our people. I've been moving to the industry 21 years ago. I'm still a physician. I'm still very proud of what I'm doing. And I think what we've been doing in the development of vaccines is a fantastic uh, approach uh, to public health. I'm still a public health uh, uh, servant, I would say, even working in the pharmaceutical industry. Is this your full-time job? Is this what you do? It is what I do. <laughs> it's very much a full-time job. Um, and I've done it probably, probably been an advocate, um, you know, within, I wouldn't say five minutes after my daughter's diagnosis, but, you know, certainly that changed my life. This, uh, this has been the greatest job I've ever had. I can't imagine having another job other than this. I have the honor to be the first Latino president of the American Cancer Society in 95 years. As a president, the medical president, medical volunteer president, that is the exact title, I am extremely honored by that. I am the spokesperson of the organization, and of course, I, as a volunteer, I work with the staff towards reaching out our mission, which is to wipe out cancer of the world through research, education, advocacy, and of course, helping people with cancer. I love my job. And I, I keep telling my younger staff that every day I go to work and I say I'm in a sweet spot. Uh, I, I cannot think of anything better because what I'm doing is firstly, very satisfying emotionally. The, the surgery I do is technically challenging and yet satisfying for me. And then there's a tremendous teaching part to what I do. And that is also uh, probably the most satisfying of all. So. You know, the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing is, when I was in medical school, one afternoon, I got a call from my dad. He was not well. So I went up to Kilimanjaro and I found him. I was in fourth year, but still I could make a diagnosis of cancer on him. He had a lymph node on the neck, and uh, eventually we discovered that he had cancer of the stomach. So he came over to the university hospital and had an operation, and uh, it was advanced tumor, and so we wouldn't expect that operation to cure him. And then off we went back home after that. But then he had a lot of suffering and pain, and uh, when I went to see him, the amount of suffering that he had convinced me that I had to do something, and I decided I would specialize in oncology. And uh, that was my journey to doing radiotherapy in the UK, and then came back here. I put a lot of effort in palliative care, because that is something that we can do, even with the little resources we have. In terms of the quality of the people that are coming up, I am very optimistic. These are superb uh, physicians. What's very difficult, though, is to, is to estimate our needs for the future. I am concerned that we're going to be um, having shortages of oncologists in Spain. Uh, the number of people that graduate every year from medical oncology residencies is in the range of 70 to 90 per year. That's the numbers we have. 
uh, the, the number of uh, schools uh, that prepare these specialists are, are slow. We need more specialists. Training in, uh, in oncology in Africa is very, very low. We don't have enough health professionals who have adequate skills to care for cancer patients. And we have a big worry that we will have a shortage of oncologists quite soon. So cancer becoming more and more frequent with aging of populations, there is uh, a big worry that there are not going to be enough doctors. We are trying to train, we are trying to train, but uh, training for oncology is a bit of a problem because it is not done in the country yet. People have got to go outside and it's very expensive to send a doctor outside and next thing that might happen is the doctor does not come back. In Peru, salaries in our hospitals are very poor. My salary after being director and minister of health and 35 years working is less than a thousand dollars a month. So with that I cannot live. I have to do private practice. And if I am in just public health, then you cannot live on that. Cancer is increasing dramatically. There was something like six, seven million cases a year in 1980. There's about 12 million this year. So you obviously need, you've got double the patients, you need double the numbers and double the resources to treat them. If it's going to double again in the next 20 years, we're going to need again double what we should have today to meet the needs of the cancer, the cancer patient worldwide. There is a need to anticipate the training for the situation in 20 years' time rather than wait for 20 years and say, we don't have enough radiotherapy machines, we don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough surgeons, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough anything. We've got to start planning for this just now because it's going to happen. Um, there's two tracks. There's the, the, the basic science track I think we're doing fine on. People like to do research, people like to go into the labs and discover new things. On the translational research, on the physician scientist side, absolutely there's been a decrease in over the years in the number of people who want to do that. And the reasons are um, well articulated. There's, the hours are long. The money isn't as good. You can make a lot more in private practice than you can working in the lab. Um, and grant funding in the U.S. Is, is especially is, has become harder and harder to come by, adding to the stress of an already hard job. I had a remarkable statistic last year at a meeting in Britain. Can't verify it, but the statistic was that there are more nurses from Malawi working in Manchester than the whole of Malawi. We want to double our space. If you have spent enough time in our cancer centre, you realise that we are full of patients. Um, we are a bit crowded. Um, we, we have been renting premises in other buildings. We have even built containers right next to the cancer centre. This is a very exciting time for us in cancer research in that we've just built a new institute for cancer medicine in Oxford and it, and it gathers together 500 top scientists and clinicians so that we can effectively try and translate our basic cancer research into new treatments for cancer patients. The Toulouse Cancer Campus, I think that it's a, it will be the, the, the most important campus against cancer, you know, specifically against cancer in Europe. For starters, at the Tata Memorial Centre, we have the Tata Memorial Hospital, which is in the middle of the city. And uh, for lack of space around, we moved 30 kilometers outside in the, in the newer part of Bombay, and it's called New Bombay, and we got 60 acres of land where we have developed what we called ACTREC, that's our center, the Advanced Center for Treatment, Research, and Education in Cancer. I think it's very important that politics, that people understand that we need some big comprehensive cancer center in Europe. It's very hard to build a good cancer hospital when you have to rely on a lot of specialists from the other medical disciplines. So if you have it next to a busy general hospital, you don't need to build up that pool of uh, medical specialists because you can always rely on the specialists from the general hospital. Is this a, a recipe that you would recommend to other countries? Yes, yes, I would recommend that, especially for the new countries that are wanting to build a new cancer centre. Don't waste your money building a big cancer hospital. Build the cancer centre next to a busy general hospital 
and work closely with the General Hospital. I hope that by now it's obvious. The global cancer community is busy preventing, treating, curing, and caring. But we still need more hospitals, more equipment, more hospices, more doctors, and more funds. More awareness is also important. People need to know that cancer is often preventable or treatable with early detection. Incredibly, more than 70% of cases in lower resource countries are diagnosed when it's too late. As Dr. Kerr said, we have to keep chipping away at the block. This can only happen if our leaders push to have cancer high on their health agenda and if every one of us makes better choices. No more excuses. Let's take better care of ourselves and let's not forget those who are less fortunate. Friends, cancer is, must someday, become cancer was.